Hi guys, awesome. So I'm from, I'm from Cape Town, uh, where we would say, how's it? But you don't have to repeat that. I'll get you to repeat something later on. So um, I have some very cool holes in my head. I've got this one here, and I've got another one at the back here. Um, and I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor who decided to infuse my healing with creativity. And, and I'm literally, it's the first time I've shared uh, my journey over the last 13 years um, when I was diagnosed with cancer to the point where I'm finally launching my Cancer Dojo mobile support tool or mobile app in 10 days on both Android and iOS. So it might get a little bit emotional. I might do a little bit of a cry on stage, but I won't, I won't. Okay, cool. So I've got these cool holes, okay, from, from brain, brain surgery. Um, this one, this one, my kids, the one in the front, because my kids are older now, but their friends say, hey, why has your dad got that hole in his head? And they say, no, it's, it's his volume button. And then they're kind of like, yeah, whatever. And then we have this great trick where I'm talking um, they come up behind me and they press the <laughs> button and then I can, count, I can speak again. But the interesting thing is when they say to their friends, oh, you try it, they're like, oh, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> it's too, too creepy. So, um, and this one here, actually, you can actually feel, there's still, you can actually feel my brain there. It was too dangerous to go back and put, to so actually, you can actually touch the brain over there. Oh, jeez! <laughs> so mean. Okay, cool. Happy people are harder to kill. They are, they are harder to kill because when people are happy, their immune systems are stronger. Unhappy people, unfortunately, because they carry baggage or they're doing the wrong thing, their immune systems are compromised. So I am I'm proud to come from a family of three brothers who are remarkably hard to kill. That's the three of us surfing. We've been big wave surfing for, I don't know, a couple of decades already. My brothers and I, so the one on the right-hand side is Chris Burtish. He's, the young, he's two years younger than me. Um, he's the guy who paddled across the Atlantic for three months on a stand-up paddleboard. I'll show you a video of that. The middle one is, is my older brother, Greg. He's surfing with a, he's had double open heart surgery and he's surfing with a metal valve in his heart. And the other one is the cancer guy, that's me. And we all inspired, we, made, we were made harder to kill with kind of like a, it's, it's sort of like a purpose that my father gave us. He was a great water man. It was actually the first catamaran in Africa that he built. And he taught us one thing, never fight the ocean. Use its power to get you to where you want to go. And it's very, very much about when you're facing a challenge, whether it's a blank page, whether it's cancer, whether it is a new job, whether it's something you fear, instead of shying away from it, dive in. Dive into it and use it. So that's the three of us. We've faced big waves like this, and they've, it's taught us how to deal with fear. And the last thing you need to do as a big wave surfer is see this thing coming and turn around and paddle to the beach, because it will be very dangerous for you. The best thing is to actually slip off your board and go into a meditative state and become part of the ocean as it throws you around and hopefully pops you out later with some air in your... So after three months, at the beginning of this year, I hadn't seen my brother for three months because he was paddling in this tiny craft. We went to meet him in Antigua after he paddled from Morocco all the way across the Atlantic by himself. And uh, it was very emotional. And, um, you're gonna see a video which I haven't really shown. So we went to meet him before we hit the coast. There he is, there's the Mickey Fish! There's Crispy, the little green light in the ocean! Crispy! Yeah! Ah, Crispy! 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 I'm trying to go back. Good man! 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 Good 
I went there, bro! Come on, son, bro! You fucking did! Okay, cool. So, <laughs> I've never in my life have I used the phrase um, crackerjack before. For some reason, I was like, I was so overwhelmed, I called him a crackerjack. It's not my lexicon. It's weird. Anyway, um, uh, I did click. Let's try again. Yes. So, 13 years ago, everything was going well. I had my beautiful family. I'd just taken over at JWT in South Africa um, as the chief creative officer. I was competing in my fifth Red Bull Big Wave Africa event. And suddenly, I started getting these headaches. And I started slurring my words. And no one could really understand it. And I went to these doctors. And they, they gave me, um, they said, oh, advertising, very stressful. Con, hey, you need it's stress headaches. So they started giving me vitamin B injections in my buttocks. Didn't work. And I went back again, and more vitamin B injections in different buttocks. And it just didn't work. And then one day I was at home, and I was, this is two months later, I was writing a note. Somebody phoned my house and said they wanted to speak to my wife, Heidi. So I wrote their number down and said, oh, she'll call you back, 083. And I put, put the phone down. I looked down, and I'd written 093. So I corrected the 9 into an 8. And I corrected it. And I looked at the page, and it was, it was a 9. So I corrected it into an 8, and it was still a 9. So I took another piece of paper, and I wrote 8. And what came out in front of me was a 9. And that was probably the scariest moment of my life when I realized that my brain was, was telling my body to do something and it, wasn't, it was doing something else. And that, became, that, be, that began my interest in, in neuroscience um, and psychoneuroimmunology, which is about how your brain and what you think can affect how your body behaves. So the neurologist, we found this tumor on the back of my, back of my head. Um, I called it Mickey, Mickey the tumor. Kind of like I saw him as this really dumb kind of mobster, the guy who does the hitting and the punching but doesn't have kind of the strategy. So I figured I was going to art fox him. Um, then I was emergency surgery. Basically, they said, okay, 72 hours, we need to get you in. We need to try and get as much of that tumor out as possible. I had to sign this form, which I've called the world's most disturbingly scary form. First of all, I said, Look, when you wake up, you, you must be prepared for the fact that you might be blind. So I was like, okay, well, whew, okay, let's have you one. Blind creative director, how does that work? Um, maybe, actually. Pip, you could help me there. Then I might be deaf, um, or I might not be myself. You might wake up and just feel like your neighbor. <laughs> and then the number 11 is the one that just says, oh, well, you might not wake up at all. And I thought, okay, there's no way I'm going to do that. I love, I believe in the mind-body connection. I love solving problems using creativity. So I thought, okay, I'm going to prepare my body for this surgery. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make my, my brain agile. It's going to be this, it's not going to be this flexible thing, waiting for implements to dig things out of it. It's going to be this flexible thing that moves, like creativity. And this is the sketch I did before I went in for brain surgery. There are typos. It's super corny. I never expected to be sharing it in the Barcelona um, Museum of Design to you guys. But the bouncy brain, I even had a sound for it. When it bounced back, when something prodded it, would just bend and bounce back. Ultimate flexibility. When I was being pushed into surgery, I was lying on the pallet getting pushed in, <coughs> and I was going, and I remember looking up and seeing the one nurse pushing the trolley, and he was looking at the other one, and he was just going, oh, this guy. <laughs> my, crazy, my crazy boinging actually came to life when I died on the surgeon's table, and that's what I woke up to. The, the surgeons didn't realize that they thought maybe because they were wearing masks, I couldn't see that they were stressed out. But they all woke, I woke up to the sounds of, everything's okay, you're fine, everything's fine. But I could see their eyes. And they were pretty freaked out. But I, anyway, I bu luckily bounced back to life and then was diagnosed with a rare form of adult brain cancer called the medulloblastoma. 
and they went into the radiation, into the, into the treatments. And I realized that I needed to do something, so I continued this diet of augmenting my treatments using my thinking. And retrospectively, it's called psychoneuroimmunology, which is how your, your mind can affect how uh, different parts of your body. What you think and do affects your physicality. So I started strengthening different parts of my body. This one was for um, radiation. I imagined radiating the radiation attack. I came up with a great words, new words, spastidization, trivialization, and then expellation, where I would expel these negative cells out into the, into the toilet after treatments. I imagined chemotherapy. So when people face chemotherapy, it's very scary because you feel like you're putting poison into your own veins. I imagine, I thought, I'm going to egg this on. I'm going to embrace this chemotherapy fizzing ride. I turned it into a fizzing ride, a roller coaster of fizzing action that would fizz out and pop my cancer cells out. Corny as hell, so please don't read it in public. It is public. You've read it. I strengthened my thyroid with these crazy thoughts. The thyroid gland that would laugh in the face of attack. They said that the double dose of radiation to the back of my brain would damage my thyroid as it came out, so I strengthened the thyroid. And then, ironically, they said, look, because of the double dose of radiation to the back of your brain, we're going to, um, you're probably going to be bald if you, after your treatment. So I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to look like a monk after, after that. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to strengthen the hair follicles in the back of my head. So I started imagining I started imagining, and this isn't imagining, it's not, this didn't actually happen, but NASA called me. NASA called me up and they said, Con, we want to harvest the hair follicles on the back of your head because we've heard that they can withstand the strength of the sun, so we want to turn it into a material that we could place over the spaceships to help the space shuttle through orbit. So I said, cool, in my mind. And then I started imagining these hairy spaceships flying through space, disseminating cancer cells into the universe. And I found this helpful. And when my hair did grow back after my years of treatment, I'm bald on the head here. I'm bald over here. Strongest hair growth, although I shaved my head, is the back of my head. So I kicked myself that I didn't do my whole head because it kind of worked on the back. So what I was doing was I wasn't helpless. And one of the biggest things with cancer is that patients are completely helpless by this chaos around them. But I wasn't helpless. I'd give myself a job, and my job was to augment all my treatments using my thinking. I wasn't helpless. Because I wasn't helpless, my immune system was stronger. My immune system is now stronger than it's ever been, purely because I continue this practice of engaging with the creativity that I, I create around myself. And I started studying other patients. I did 120 of these sketches on sticky notes of patients who I did it for myself because they said I might lose memories and things during treatment. And what I realized that they weren't, they weren't in it. They weren't involved like I was. They were the, the, traditional, the traditional patient who is lost and at the mercy of the drugs, hoping that they'll survive. So I thought, wow, well, how can I share my thinking? Like, how could I share my creativity with other people so that they could see and start engaging with their own um, treatments? So I was thinking about this idea, how do I do it, how do I... And I went back to work, and everyone was very nice. I was back after my surgeries and everything. Got back to work, and, and I also learned how people... Not only patients are disenabled by the disease, but their supporters and their loved ones. They don't, people don't know what to say. They don't know how to deal with you. So the, one of the smartest, smartest people I, I met when I got back into the agency, she came up to me, she said, oh, Con, I heard you had brain cancer. And I said, yes. And she said, oh, my aunt had brain cancer. And I said, oh, how, how is she? She said, oh, no, she died. And I was like, oh, jeez, OK, well, thanks a lot. So uh, <laughs> into the product that I'm building, there are a lot of tips for supporters, because you get people come up to you and say, oh, Con, you know, you know everything happens for a reason, Con. I'm like, OK. And Con, you know, God only picks the, the, the prettiest flowers for his garden. I'm like, dude, I'm still here. You know, I'm like, I'm here. Don't, you don't have, I'm not a pretty flower right now, poor God. Anyway, so I realized at the time that I was, I was feeling um, more risk-averse. I was 
everyone says to you, how are you feeling after your treatments? Are you okay? And you say, yeah, no, I'm fine. Yeah, everything's fine. No, it's all good. All fine. All fine. But you're not fine at all. I realized that I was risk averse. I, was, I felt like I wasn't myself. I was, I was living a kind of scared life. And, and so I put up this sign in Cape Town. I put it up at night, and I'm not sure why I did it. Um, I felt like a little bit like Banksy putting up a sign on, on the freeway. It linked to an old cell phone, um, and I just listened to hear who would phone. And I, people did. People phoned. They wanted to know why was I, what's going on. I put up another one for therapeutic herbal weed, which got a lot of calls. <laughs> and then I put up another one, swimming lessons where you shouldn't swim. <laughs> Why are you swimming? Where did you get your license? So I started getting between five and six messages a day, uh, and another four or five were just laughing or people hanging up because they were confused. This one got a lot of calls. Everyone wanted to come to this party club. They loved it. Oh, did you kick the sign down? I wanted to. How do I join? I want my son to come to your karate club. This is still available in Cape Town. If anyone's around wants to visit, I can organize good price. Um, and this one, weirdly enough, is how Chris and I actually met. <laughs> yeah. He phoned me up. He was lonely in Cape Town while he was there. And we, obviously, I never replied, though, to any of those messages. This one went up outside the Cape Town High Court. We have a lot of crime in Cape Town. So there are constantly people moving up and down the stairs, police, lawyers, and criminals. And believe me, I got calls for alibis. <laughs> how much is an alibi? Where do I get it? How do I meet you? Where? Huh? This, I pushed the realms of believability to um, haircuts, private parts. And weirdly enough, you, the people who you would call, it was kind of this experiment, this, the people who you would think would call are often not the people who call. So this one, my mem most memorable response was a little old lady, and you could hear from her voice, she was very smart, la -di da from Constantial Bishop's Court. And she said, I'd like you to cut my dog's private parts, please, because I can't bear to go down there. Happy endings, then people started playing with this idea. And that somebody actually stole happy endings and then sent me a text message uh, to that number of where he had taken it or she had taken it to. And it was a famous Cape Town um, strip club, and he had put it on top of the logo for the, the strip club, which I thought was pretty out there. Um, <laughs> got a call from the police for this one. Um, apparently, the story is that the horse ladies rode past the crossing and ripped the sign off and galloped up to the police station and demanded that Captain Bester find out who's behind this, where's this meat coming from. That's the South African accent. Okay, I live in Africa, okay? So this sign went up, toes, wide range. Yep. I live in Africa. First day it went up, I got my most memorable call. She phoned and she said, hello? I'm calling about the toes. Call me back. I never called anyone back. I just listened to the messages. But she phoned the next day. It's me again. I'm calling about the toes. I forgot to tell you which toe. I want the left foot, baby toe, because my toe is a Satan's toe. It's a Satan's toe. OK. I was like, OK, OK, cool. I also had some action with our president when he was um, elected. That in, in South Africa, there's a lot of tenders, tenderpreneurs who get lots of money, and he's one of them. I was shooting a, a commercial in LA, and I managed to jump off in New York and um, exhibit my work at the um, Metropolitan Museum of, of Art next to Eve Klein. Um, it says Kunz, which means art in, in Afrikaans. Um, so I exhibited for at some, about five hours before I got a call from the gallery saying, What is this? What have you done? I put one up in the meatpacking districts, too, um, but it's in, it was in Afrikaans, so you won't get it. Lekanai means nice. Yeah, I got some calls. Um, coffin, I started delving into the fear that I was worrying about, like, this cancer. What would I, how, how would I, what would I? So I started, if I died, I just thought I'd, I'd dive in, and so I started creating these coffin, used coffin. If I did die, maybe my family could sell the coffin and make some cash. I got some calls for this one. But essentially what I was doing is I was asking for friends. I was feeding myself 
And this is when I started researching more about how support and people who love you, how they can affect your immune system positively if they're engaged and they know what to do. And I called them all my secret club. I called this whole project my secret club. This, this got twice as many calls as any of the others. And it was bizarre. Everyone wants to join the secret club. And the one guy called me up, and his name was Nell. He said, my, hi, uh, my name is Nell. I saw you putting up the sign on the freeway, and I want to join the secret club. But I don't know how it works. Do, 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 do I call you, or do you call me, or don't we meet? <laughs> nope, we don't meet. So no, I never met Nell. So what I was doing was boosting my immune system over time. I wasn't falling into the funk of cancer like these guys because I'd given myself a, a job to do. And, this, and then I started experimenting with other medium, scribbling things on walls, um, creating weird projects, swimming with sharks, um, yeah, walking into the Chinese embassy with a panga because three sharks are killed every second for, um, for um, shark fin soup. I started exploring different ways to feed myself using creativity. And this really dovetails to all of the other speakers about how we have this incredible gift as creative people. The majority of people in the world do not have this gift. And we are able to take something that's invisible and make it visible. So really be careful about what you do with your, how you curate it, how you craft it, how you feed it the right stuff, because it is hugely powerful. Um, and that's where I was thinking, like, how do I help people who don't have, who, who are in this, this, this cancer funk? Um, and I launched Cancer Dojo off the three reasons. There are three reasons why people weren't doing the kind of crazy stuff that I was doing. The first thing is that traditional medicine doesn't give you a role as a patient. It gives you a drug or a pill or a... This is learned helplessness that we've been doing for the last five centuries in Western medicine. The second thing is that the fear of cancer is just all-consuming, and people are just completely floored by it. And the third thing is that the majority of people in the world are not visual thinkers, but they can be visual thinkers. But you guys are visual thinkers, so you've got to use that. So I launched, launched Cancer Dojo in, by putting it out there about what I was looking for. How do I make cancer visible? Um, I was approached by two big oncologists who said, cool, two professors of oncology. They said, oh, we like your thinking, Con. We want you, to, we want you to, to do a talk for a whole bunch of oncologists. And um, the next thing I knew, I was presenting to 1,400 oncologists at the biggest oncology conference in, in Africa. And I was petrified. Here I was as this crazy creative guy coming up with weird ideas to, to help people with cancer. But I got a standing ovation purely because doctors around the world and oncologists, they know they're missing a trick. And that's the humanizing of medicine and technology. How do we include the patient? How do we humanize medicine? And creativity is this route. So post this, I went for a paddle. And I always carry a piece of chalk with me. So I paddled out to the ship. And I started thinking this could be a great way to start getting humans to patients and, and cancer patients to start thinking differently about the disease. So I wrote on the side of the ship, imagine your cancer was a ship. And you were an ocean of I can sink it. Unfortunately, there was a, a six-foot swell running. So I was literally having to go up with the swell and write one letter per swell and then go down and wait to come up with the next one. So I was out there for 45 minutes. And before I knew it, this, this um, speedboat came burning around the side of the boat filled with um, six, uh, um, six um, customs officials with um, automatic weapons saying, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm just drawing on this boat. And luckily, they didn't shoot me. Um, so I paddled around the other side of the boat and saw that, that there was a sign that said, tug, where the tugboats. So I couldn't help but just write, I did, but nothing happened. Um, nothing did happen, thankfully. So if we want to change the way people see cancer, we have to change the way they search it. I started working. Um, on, on ways to get humans to think differently about their disease. And I started to pull in a collective of people. We're all connected by cancer. It is the one thing that connects all of us on the planet, race, gender, religion, age. We're all connected by this one thing. And creative people are, are, are great souls who want to use their talents for, for, for something positive. 
So I started getting people to follow my first imagining, which is imagine your cats are with these birds and you are a clap of the hands, which I used my chalk on somebody's wall, and he didn't like that. But when I, he saw cancer, he let me complete the, the work. So I started getting more of these. Imagine you're, you are a baseball bat and your cancer is the ball. Imagine your cancer is an ice cream and you're a heat wave. Imagine your cancer was an Oreo and you're the cookie monster. <laughs> Imagine your cancer is an 8-bit bad guy and you are a super-powered Italian plumber. Imagine your cancer was a Vander Holyfield's ear and you are Mike Tyson. Imagine your cancer is a balloon and you are the pin. Imagine your cancer was apartheid and you are Mandela. And we started targeting specific thinking for specific types of cancer. Imagine your ovarian cancer was a pencil drawing and you are an eraser. I love this one. Imagine your cancer is physics and you're a Bollywood action hero. <laughs> Imagine your cancer was Mr. Miyagi. And then we started using videos which, is, which are populated into the product that we're offering now. So the tone is intent. The tone of, of the work is intentionally playful and fun, and debunking fear with with humor, irreverence, um, yet at the same time bringing a very um, important message um, for the for the audience. So the Cancer Dojo app um, is finally going to launch in in two weeks' time on app stores, and it is. 16 levels of behavior change um, methodology and creative tricks and tools, and it is yeah it it's every you 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 earn badges every level. Um, we have other products like we're working on a, a workbook which is almost like a doodle book for cancer, getting people to actually start engaging, teaching them to overcome their fear of the blank page as well as cancer at the same time. And we're looking to expand our dojos to other diseases. So I know I'm coming to the end of the time. So my first talk where I actually met Jamshit, I met you in, at the IF Italians Festival, and I've kept it in, always kept it in my presentations. This is where I break the fourth wall, and I speak to the audience. Um, and it's the serious part. So in South Africa, we, say, we don't say serious. When something's really serious, we say serious. So now you guys have to say serious on the count of three, but you've got to say serious. You've got to put ah, you've got to go, ah, okay, at the end of it. So on the count of three, you have to say serious. One, two, three. Serious. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Excellent. So this is the, the breaking the fourth wall is I, I'm talking to you now. You guys have, you have something that other people don't have. You have the ability to visualize and make real. These patients, they don't... They've got cancer, I don't know what to do, I can't think, I, I don't even know what it is, it's in there, I, I don't know, I can't do anything. And it's not just cancer, I'm looking at any kind of cancer. Cancer is, is a bad relationship, a bad job, something you hate, something baggage you, you, that's carrying you, that's holding you back, somebody for, you didn't forgive or you haven't forgiven yourself, something has happened in your past. What I've learned over the last 13 years, studying, studying the brain and the body, the more you hang on to and you don't get rid of that baggage that we all carry, the more it compromises your immune system over time and makes you more susceptible to disease. So think about what you carry and deal with it as fast as you can, like tomorrow. Just deal with it. Get, try and get rid of all of that baggage because happy people are hard to kill. And you have the tools to do that because you can express yourself like many other people can't. Put it down on a piece of paper, journal, write, draw, and there it is, and then deal with it fast. And that is my talk, guys. So happy people are harder to kill, and thank you for having me here. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much, Bond.